I'm Todd Sanders, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Chamber. We appreciate you joining us for today's webinar. I'd like to begin by thanking today's sponsors who continue to demonstrate their commitment to our, our chamber, our community, and our country on a, on a daily basis. So a virtual round of applause for APS, SRP, Benamore Craig for their support. Also, uh, the unsung heroes in all of this, the people who make this all look good. I want a, a quick shout out to my team who has done such an amazing job from day one. We flipped the switch, we went virtual, and they are absolutely tremendous. So thank you to them for everything they do. So today's presentation really is important for the business community as we continue to navigate the changing work environment amid a public health crisis. It's critical that we continue to analyze and adapt our work style and services during this time. We hope that today's presentation will give you some of the tools you need to ensure that your business continuity plans are successful in the weeks and months ahead. During the presentation, you can submit questions and I, and I urge you to do that in the, in the Q and A box on the side of your screen. So get those done. Um, and as time permits, we'll get through as many as we can. We've had good luck in the past, so go ahead and start submitting your questions or during the presentation is fine as well. So now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Matt Bennett. Matt's a leader in the business advisory services practice at Slalom Consulting, a modern consulting firm focused on strategy, technology, and business transformation. He specializes in delivering complex solutions to diverse sets of stakeholders and customers through change management, organizational design, customer experience, and operational effectiveness. So with that, please welcome Matt. Matt, over to you. Thanks, Todd, and, and thanks everyone for, for joining me here today. Um, I have the great honor of, of joining the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce to discuss a um, exciting topic around the next way of work. And I say exciting knowing that we're all currently living a um, temporary norm, and I'll get to what that, that means. And um, from, from where I am, I'm at my house here in um, a small suburb outside of Denver, Colorado. Um, I, I have a couple co-workers, uh, a 75 pound German Shepherd, um, Siberian Husky mix, and a 13 pound Pug Boston mix that may interrupt me. So if that does happen, please bear with me. I will try to get them under control. Um, but with that, I'm gonna share a presentation and um, talk to you about a concept that a couple of the folks here in the um, slalom organization have been working on. And, and the focus of this pre presentation is what we're calling the next way of work. And it's important to remember that you know, with COVID-19 and with the pandemic that we all are now very aware of, um, there is potential that with no pharmaceutical treatments and with a now understanding of what those pharmaceutical treatments may mean, the interventions really have to have focused on contact tracing, quarantine, and social distancing. Moving forward, and this is a, a study from the American Association for the Advancement of Science that came out about a week and a half ago, um, they're, they're stating that the required intensity, duration, and urgency of these responses are going to depend on how this initial wave unfolds and then what happens after the subsequent um, transmission of, of COVID-19. So what is important to know and remember here is that um, it's, it's important to take what is being available and what research is available, but understanding this is not a temporary um, problem. This is something that, would, can, that could continue to have impacts for um, you know, months and, and potentially years to come. So as we think about that, and as we think about what the pandemic and what the timeline that, that the pandemic done, really more than anything, it has accelerated the pace of change for the, a lot of things that we now experience in our working lives. And we're, you've probably heard this a number of times from a lot of different um, news stories and outlets and, and, and white papers. Uh, we are in a period of evolving normals. And there was the last normal, which was everything that happened prior to COVID-19. You got up in the morning, you took a shower, you, you, you got ready and you commuted to work that was drastically changed after there was in place social distancing, stay at home orders, and this is really a temporary normal. And I think that is important to remember because when we think about this temporary normal, the shifting corporate policies, the working remote, the updating benefits, those are temporary, but that doesn't mean that there's not a ability to act to, to make sure that we're not clinging to the old normal or this temporary normal and then starting to plan for what that new normal will be. 
And so this context around normal and what it means to be normal is really going to be challenged, especially as we think about moving into this next normal and the next way of working, which is focused on, in our opinion, reimagining that next way of work. I'm going to talk about four key areas in reimagining the next way of work. Um, and and I have a, I've got a slide for each one of these. Um, this is not to say that these are exhaustive, but as we have talked with our clients, worked with our internal partners here uh, at Slalom Consulting. These are four key areas that we've found are, are top of mind for folks and really do set the stage for a lot more in-depth conversations. So what I'm hoping to do with you today is just make sure that you're understanding why we talk about these things, what they may be for you, and challenge some of those things that you may be putting in place to um, prepare your employees, prepare that physical workspace, and transition those, those employees and your customers to this next way of work. So the first competency or, or, or the first um, you know, item that I wanted to, to, to focus on was the identity of the response effort within an organization. And, and that relates to the brand, the culture, and the team. And really what we, we thought about is what can we do to protect the trust of our employees and our customers during this time? The next is what do we want to continue or think about taking with us from this remote work time period with this temporary norm in some cases and depending on your industry and your level of um, existing remote work, there may be things that you escalated for the first time ever and you may have moved up your digital transformation or your ability to create a remote workforce by you know, five, 10 years. So what have we learned during this time period and what are we going to be able to keep? And part of that goes into your re-onboarding of employees back to the physical space. And when I say re-onboarding, it's not like we have to train them on things that they missed or didn't learn during this time period. There's going to be a, a, a plan and a structure in place to bring them back to the physical space. So making sure we have the right level of support and transitional activities built in is critical so that when they do get to that last step, which is that physical space, they feel confident that they have um, you know, an organization that cares about their health and that they are doing things to keep the physical space in a way that it can give them um, a, 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 a security around what it means to be, be healthy and safe given the, the way that COVID-19 spreads and, and is transmitted. Um, the, the first response identity topic that I'll, I'll talk through here is this, this, this image on the right here is something that you, may be familiar to you. It was a, a um, framework that you saw, that, that many people saw early on in, in the pandemic around how will you respond. And this concept that as an individual, we have a tendency to um, start at a place of fear and then from there, go into a place of learning, and then from there go into a place of growth. As we think about organizations and how they can respond, there is truly a, an ability for, for COVID-19 and the response effort to define what it means for the culture, for the brand, and for the employee experience for years to come. And when the, the, the pandemic started, it was absolutely natural to, and, 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 and really we had to react. Right? And in that way, it may have included closing those physical locations, furloughing employees, freezing or cutting employee hours, and then working to support employees working remotely. So those were all the things that we've all now had to do over the last you know, six to eight weeks, depending on your, your current situation and, and, and your, your organization, industry, and all of those things. Today, really what we think is the opportunity that we would want everyone to be aware of is that there is an ability to respond to that next way of work. And there's lots and lots of information that is, is currently available through online resources, through checklists. And it comes down to understanding what is happening in your current model and trying to figure out where you wanna plan for and move forward from this current temporary norm. And so this is where you hear a lot about um, uh, business continuity, understanding productivity of your, your organization in this remote working time period. And it's critical to remember to, to monitor all of the, the guidance that's coming out. 
it is a ever-changing and uncertain time period that we're in. And so making sure that you have the ability to respond and then adapt is key to then be able to restore in the next phase and build and protect that trust with our employees, our customers, and get us to this place of being able to, to learn and grow out of this. And so you can see on this slide that there are things that, that we would expect uh, uh, organizations to be thinking about and, and putting in place. Um, some of these are, are, are pretty basic, right? Like um, a secure testing and, and case tracing mechanism. That is, is, is something that we know is recommended by OSHA and the WHO and CDC have um, recommended that the organizations start to think through how they can um, potentially at least use a some type of mechanism to, to, to track any new cases or potential cases to help do case contracting, right, or, or case tracing. Um, that is something that is very unique to the situation, but developing resiliency, um, creating you know, simple technology solutions in this time period that meet some of those new needs. Those are things that can, can be in place for years to come. And then what we would really want to strive for and what we're, what we're excited about is that a lot of, of, of organizations are looking to use this as an opportunistic way to reimagine their business model. We've seen it happen day in and day out. The, the buy online or the, the buy online and pick up in store, even some of the, the ways that retail and, and um, food services have changed their models, right? Those are reimagining a, a workplace and a, a response that's going to meet the needs of both the brand, the employees, and the culture. In, in Slalom's world, right, what we're thinking about is that six foot workspace. We're thinking about how we potentially change the way that we think about permanent on-site people, right? And, 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 and take that all into effect. And so the reimagined phase may be different for each employee or, or each organization. And it's really critical to remember that what we're trying to work towards is a, an effective response that meets our brand needs, our culture needs, and our employee needs. Key to this, and one of the things that we're all really experiencing now is remote work. And so there have been some studies that have been done and it was estimated that up to 57% of the US workforce started to work from home or work remotely for the first time um, ever. So that means that during this time period, we're learning a lot about what it means to have a remote workforce. And knowing that, if you can see on this, this, this graphic here on the right side, every organization started in a different spot. If you had a large remote workforce, this probably didn't have as much of an impact on you. And if you only had to, uh, if you were in a state or within a county or a region that didn't have a, as long of a disruption in that remote working time period, it may be best to just think about documenting what worked well in case there is another resurgence or there is another a time period where we will have to convert some of our live workers to remote. There also could be a situation where you're going to look to improve and understand how we can actually get better at doing remote work and introduce permanent policies or adapt your model to bring in and, and better meet those remote learning needs uh, or, or remote working needs. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that if you are in a place where the disruption and the way that this is going to continue to impact your organization is, is going to be a, a, an opportunistic way to reimagine what's happening, think about forming a new business model and, and do that in a way where you're workshopping, you're brainstorming, you're documenting what to carry forward, what to stop, and how you could potentially reduce some of those operations and capital expenditures in this way with this new model. So it's really a way, and this is where a lot of our, our, our partners and clients that we've worked with have, have focused on this. I would say don't lose sight of the fact that there's going to be a lot of trust that was gained and also potentially trust that was lost from your, your, your employees when they started to work from home. Uh, I'll share a, a story here around one of the clients that we've worked with. And um, this client has for years made the case to their um, employees that working from home will not give us the same level of productivity. We need to be here so that we can have the right level of speed to do this type of work in this way. They weren't really given a choice at the end of March and they had to, as much as possible, convert these workers to remote. Now, what they have found is, okay, we didn't lose any productivity. 
all of our workers seem to have the right level of, of speed and bandwidth where they can actually do everything that they, we want them to do. And how do we now adjust to and make sure that we're building back up that trust by acknowledging that there was some inaccuracies or even misconceptions around the organization's perception of remote work and we want to do what's right back to the, the, the brand response and give our, our employees a restorative model that allows them to not only see that this is an adaptive organization, but we can reimagine the way that we work. All of that is going to culminate with actually bringing employees back to the physical space. And our re-entry strategy, in, in our opinion, has four key um, components that are grounded in some of the, the core kind of business processes and, and critical elements that will, will make sure that you are doing this in a way that meets your employee brand and customer needs. So top of mind for, for us is really employees' experience. And, and they're the ones that ultimately have to be able to feel confident and trust that they're coming back into a workspace that is going to give them that that level of, of security as well as um, safety in their own health. And so we've heard and seen that there are, are organizations and Slalom is setting up a communications portal where we can have a um, way to get the most timely information, but also report back out on potential situations that need to be um, clear or, or, or communicated to a, a larger audience, right? Um, so helping to give those, those employees um, expectations for return, documenting what it means to return back to the appropriate phase, and then some, some really interesting and, and, and innovative ideas around potentially, um, you know, communicating to families or, or, you know, reviewing your policies around PTO or, or um, you know, FMLA, those things like that. Next is obviously the, the government, right? You want to make sure that there is the overall reentry strat strategy that is grounded in state and county guidance. Um, if you are a company that has uh, global operations, that is a different scenario and that this is coronavirus, COVID-19 is truly a um, community-based and, and also um, it, it, it's very regional. And so we can't say that what the strategy is that is happening in Hong Kong or Singapore or Taiwan is going to work for um, you know, Phoenix or Tempe or, or you know, Colorado Springs or Colorado and, and where, or Denver, and where do those all fit? It's important to remember that, that the state and county public health departments have the most accurate and up-to-date data. So understanding how you're going to use that guidance and what you're going to do with it is, is really key to the success and ongoing understanding of what it means to manage that reentry. Um, the other piece to this is that there will probably be potential, like we said, reinsurgence and intermittent opening and closings that are going to be location specific. And so if you do have global or even national operations, making sure that there is clear consistency in communication and that you do have a, a policy in place where there's a clear um, process to follow for when that, that those new guidance start to come out and how that affects the workplace cont continuity strategy and the real estate strategies. So workplace continuity strategies, I'll go more in detail into this in the final section, which is about restoring that physical space. But this is really what we've heard is the, the most challenging thing on a lot of our, our clients' mind right now, which is what is that opening cr criteria? What is the right time to open? No one wants to be first, right? Everyone is going to wait and see and, and, and try to figure out, okay, if, if this is the date that we can bring people back, why don't we give it a few weeks to see what happens? And that I think is gonna be the norm, but making sure that there is communication and that we are during this time period understanding like who needs to come back? What are those critical personnel? That's the new word that I've started to hear quite a lot. It, it went from essential workers and, and, and non-essential. And now that we're bringing back people and saying that they can be in the physical space, what are those critical personnel that are going to need to be in that physical space to do their work, right? So understanding who are those people that need to be there, potentially creating a cohort-based group depending on the situations, and then clearly communicating that. In Denver, for example, or in Colorado, for example, um, we have moved out of a current phase to this next phase that allows um, non-essential businesses to limit, to bring back employees into a physical space 
but they have to be able to do that at 50% capacity. That is great guidance, logistics, and the change management, and the communications, and the process, and the, all of those things. The, the state government's not going to provide that for us. That's what an organization will have to decide what makes the most sense. And if it's if it's team based, if it's if it's functionality based, or or how is that going to work? Those are all things that, that folks are working through right now. And it's going to be unique to you, your situation, your, your industry, and how you are working through this challenge, given your overall pandemic impact where you are. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is that real estate strategies are another big one as you think about bringing employees back. There is now, with the continuity of remote work, with this now trust that we have in employees to potentially get their work done re remotely, can we think about potential capital reductions if we do bring in or, or have less permanent on-site workforces? So that is a, a big landlord and, and real estate um, strategy. The other piece is how, how is cleaning and sanitation protocols going to align with this? What are the modifications of potential amenities? And then what are those security updates? So going into this a little bit in more detail around the physical space, I think this is where we've seen the most confusion, but also the most um, innovation that can happen in reimagining of that workplace and reimagining it in context of protecting your employees and doing what's right for your culture and your brand. So obviously, the first thing to think about is that physical distancing. So um, if, you, if you were to Google the, the six-foot workspace right now, um, you'll find a number of articles about it. If you look at some of the large commercial real estate uh, uh, vendors out there, they're going to have a checklist for you on, on what to think through. So making sure that there is physical separation, making sure that you are only allowing a certain population of your um, employees back into the office, and then following those guidelines, potentially giving discretionary spend, and then working with health authority guidelines to figure out what those best practices are. It's not to say it is that simple, but there's a lot to think about in opening the physical space and offices may need to be thought about drastically different. And so those are kind of the basic tenets, but what you can do with this from a reimagined standpoint is gonna be where we, we think that um, the, the winning, right? The, the, the value and the impact that, that organizations can make to their employees to show that they care and show that they are doing things, right? Um, things like, moving back to cubes, putting in place um, physical or, or, or dividers, right? These are some things we've heard. Um, the, the other piece is that there's visitors that come into a space. There's, there's shared office spaces where you may not have control of or, or have the ability to influence all of the employees in a physical space. It may be that there's a front desk or a front door employee around or, or, or policy around the screening of visitors, screening of employees, um, potentially personal protective equipment. Masks have been a very hot topic over the past few weeks. And there are a number of companies and organizations that have said that you, know, you need to be wearing a mask to come into this place. And certain businesses that are not allowing people to enter into their space without, without um, masks on. So that will be another um, challenging, uh, challenge that, that organizations will have to try to understand. Um, procurement of those masks is going to be um, something that, that will need to be considered and, and making sure that we're, we're doing it for the right reasons, right? If you've figured out your physical space and you've got your work, your, your, your flows of people down where you're never going to have to have people be within a six foot distance of each other, you may not need those masks, right? So really understanding the guidance from the WHO is critical there from the CDC and, and putting in place measures that speak to feeling secure in this physical location, understanding what the, the, the different transmission um, vectors are, and then helping employees feel confident that you're, you're doing everything in your power to make them feel safe in that way. Um, but things like interviews, things like elevator wait times, um, we heard that there are certain businesses or, or office spaces in Hong Kong, for example, that are, are creating, you know, reduced queue times for or, or reducing the number of people that can queue for an elevator. And then in that elevator, they're actually putting personal protective equipment. So lots of innovative stuff happening throughout the world. 
we're still at the point where we're going to understand what this means. And so um, lots of, of, of front desk and physical boundaries that need to be um, understood and also managed while we are managing that reentry. Um, policies and procedures are going to be incre increasingly critical, um, knowing that we're going to have to be iterative, we're going to have to be agile, and, and making sure that those are clearly communicated. Um, like I said, critical staff is the, the key one here and actually communicating what it means to be critical on-site staff. Um, things about meetings and events and conferences. Um, we heard that Facebook is, is canceling all of their events for the entire year, right? And they don't expect that they will actually have any large events until um, you know, mid-2021. Mid um, travel restrictions in, in, in reporting. Um, there's this interesting concept that I was talking to one of our other clients about, which is today, if we were to, to want to partner with a, a organization, we show value and we show that we care by having a big team get on an airplane and travel so that we show, look, we all showed up, we're all here. Maybe in the future, it shows caring and compassion to send one person so that we're showing that, hey, we're limiting the, 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 the exposure or the risk that we're bringing to you or saying, hey, we're going to do this, this meeting virtually. We've changed our understanding of what is possible in virtual engagements and those policies around the travel and, and how we actually report on any necessary travel will be a, a big defining factor moving forward. Um, and, and then, you know, last here around the, the, the policies and procedures, especially as you think about the, the staggering on and bringing people back in, in reduced capacity is understanding what is that operational tempo and looking at even some of our learnings from our, our military and, and, and former, um, um, former um, you know, we, we have a lot of, of former um, army, army and, and army officers. And so they have really helped us to understand that, that operational tempo in, in, their, in their terminology is something that still needs to be in place today. You can't have all of HR come back and, or, or all of IT come back without the right level or without the right levels of, of checks and balances in place, right? And so having a, a clear capacity defined, understanding how you phase folks back to maintain that operational tempo is going to be key there from a policies and procedures standpoint. And then the last one that I think I've touched on a, a few times here, but has also become a, a hot topic is what does it mean to test and trace and do follow up with our, our, our organization? So um, this is a, a topic that there's a lot of different perspectives out there, and um, I, I don't want to say that there's one way to do this. Um, the guidance and what we are, are, are being told is, is really that it is a, a best practice to have some type of site-based um, employee symptom checkers. So whether that be a you know, temperature check or a thermal screen at the door, or a self-reported way to potentially report if a, a colleague or an employee is having a um, potential exposure, right? Um, so that there can be some quarantining of that person. So there can be some um, notification to anyone who, who may have been contacted. There's privacy and security concerns around this. And so what I would say is make sure that you are following those and thinking about this in, in reference to keeping that, that, that PHI information safe, but also understanding what you can share to protect and, and do some of the, the communication out if there is a, a known case and there needs to be that contact tracing effort. Um, there's, there's great technology that's available out there. If you look at some of the, the large partners in this space like Salesforce and AWS and Microsoft, they have been able to quickly spin up some, um, you know, some contact tracing modules that can be easily leveraged. But what I would say is leverage what you've got. Don't go out and buy a huge solution for this because if, you're, if you've done um, some of this, if you've done flu vaccination checks or, or if you've done um, any type of secure monitoring of information that needs to be only um, for, for an employee and for those who are in a position where they can have access, um, you don't need to go out and buy anything new. Um, and then with all of this, employee training and adoption is going to be key. So, um, lots to think through in the physical space. Um, so much information out there. This is obviously just scratching the surface. 
Um, what I will end with is a, a, a quote from um, Dr. Michael Ryan, and you may have seen this, it was quoted a number of times um, by a number of, of articles and, and by um, different agencies throughout the, the initial response to the pandemic. Um, and it says, if you need to be right before you move, you will lose. Speed trumps perfection. Perfection is the enemy of good when it comes to emergency management. And I was challenged by, by a few folks in using this, this quote, and uh, because Right, a lot of us are not in a position where we do emergency management. We're not in the position where we do healthcare response. And we are also in this time period where it is going to be a communal problem. It is gonna be a challenge that we all have to collectively come together to understand and figure out what we can do to protect the health of our, our, ourselves, our families and our employees so that we can move forward. And what I like about this quote is it talks about just being agile, knowing that there's no perfect answer here. This is uncertain. There is change. We will see what will happen in the coming months, but we don't really know. So starting to plan, starting to, to get some um, teams aligned, starting to get the people focused on this stuff in the right way so that there can be a plan and we can move quickly to respond and then restore that space and then eventually reimagine it. That's the path forward that I think we're all looking for. And that's why I wanted to include this here. So um, that's the end of, of, of my presentation. I know that there were some questions that were prepared. So I will stop sharing now and then jump back into the Zoom. Well, Matt, thank you uh, very much for not only for being with us, but for, for really bringing a lot to the table to discuss. I know there are so many employers, Chamber uh, as well, that are trying to figure this out. But I will tell you that you, know, you probably have a few people a little jealous because it's 106 here. I noticed it's 74 in Denver. So you mentioned Denver a few times and now we're all pretty jealous. Um, but uh, but you know, thinking about what you said, you know, there, there's so much to think about. Um, as a business owner, um, you know, what, is the, what, are, what is the first one or two things that you know, now we're getting into May, people are starting thinking about coming back. Obviously in Colorado, that's happening as well. You know, what would you say is the, the first two or three things that they need to, to do today? Yeah, and I think it, it is those, those first two points that I brought up, figuring out how we want to respond, right? What is the strategy around our response? And I broke it into those, those four phases, right? React, re um, respond, restore, reimagine. That to me, if, if those are the phases you want to use, great. Use those and run with it. And, and, and so that to me is the first start, right? Figure out how we're gonna think through phasing this back because it's not, it's not a switch, it's a dial, right? And I really like that analogy that I've heard a few times. Um, and, and dialing back the team is gonna take thoughtful steps and, and making sure that we're understanding what those are and how they're going to um, impact our culture, our brand and our people is, is, is the core. Um, to do that, what I would say is, start a crisis team, right? Um, call it whatever you want it, right? I mean, there's, there's hundreds of names that you can come up with, but get a small group of, of, of agile folks together who can work on creating that plan and, 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 and driving forward the right people to, to pick it up. And then from there, I would say remote work, right? Working remotely has proven to be a, a, a viable path forward and a way that a lot of companies have found they can be more just as productive, if not more productive, but don't lose sight of the fact that there are also certain situations, um, parents with, with children, right? Um, um, people who don't have a, a, a good working space at their home. And so keeping what's good, but also acknowledging that it's not gonna be the same for everyone. So um, create the strategy, create a team, start with remote working. Oh, thank you. And, and I wanna get back to remote working in a minute, but something you said, caught my attention and it, it really catalyzed some thoughts and that's operational tempo because when you start thinking about you know maybe you have half the staff there if you don't have the right mix you're gonna you're not gonna have that operational tempo it's not gonna work um, talk to us a little bit about how you go about thinking about that and and implementing something like that yeah yeah absolutely I think it's a great concept and, and I, the analogy that I've been using is um, I'm a, a I'm a consultant, right? For, for lack of a better term, I'm a consultant, meaning that I, I have a number of teams that I work with. I have a team that is on my, the consultant side in slalom, and then I have a couple client teams, and then I have maybe um, other teams that I work with in a tertiary way. If I come into the office 
I would want to work with those groups of people, right? And that would be the goal, right? We all are looking to get back to a physical space so that we can you know, see each other and experience that. But if I come back and I'm the only one in the office and all of the rest of my teams are still remote, right? What good did that do me? And so it, it, as we think about the remote tempo or the, 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 the operational tempo and bringing it back, that's where start with understanding who are those critical workers that need to be in the office to get their jobs done and, and bring them back first and make sure that they feel secure, they understand where their space is and then create the, 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 the cadence or the cycle for that. And then figure out what are those additional um, phased ways to bring people back that won't upend the entire system. Like I was saying, you can't bring all of finance back before you have some IT support in place. You can't bring all of your operations staff before you, before you have some, some you know, HR infrastructure in place if there is an employee, um, you know, employee issue while, while, while um, on the physical side. So those types of things. Obviously, there's lots of changing dynamics in there, but um, it, it's all about making sure that you're not just flipping the switch, you're looking at it as a dial and knowing that there's a lot of interdependent that come with this. And so doing a lot of scenario planning, thinking about this as you would a business continuity challenge problem and, and doing some of the scenario planning with the, the, the bringing folks back to that physical space. Well, it's such an interesting topic. And you, I guess it goes into the physical space. I had a conversation with someone who works at a Fortune 500 and their comment was, you know, if, the, if we're going to have to be socially distanced at work, um, we're probably going to have to have virtual meetings from our desks. And so what's the point? Why wouldn't we stay home? And that doesn't allow for that tempo that you talked about too. So it really, it goes into so much more than, um, than just one or two things. And yeah, absolutely, 100%. And then um, it, it might be a strange word to use, but equity, right? It is going to, we're, we're gonna have this hybrid model and how do we make it so that folks who are remote or, or th that they still get the same level of like, pre-meeting conversation, the post-meeting conversation, like FOMO is not going to go away. People are going to want to see each other. They're going to want to be in that physical space. So we need to be able to do things that, that acknowledge you're just as part of this team, your voice is just as heard, and change the way we think about meetings, change the way we think about, you know, engaging with people where it's like, oh, you know, um, Sally's on the phone, so we'll just ignore her uh, unless she speaks up. That, those are all things that are part of this next way of work. Absolutely, good call. Yeah, and you know, so that leads me to you know, the remote question. I, I'm assuming that a lot of the commercial real estate guys that are watching are, are probably wondering well, what's next. Uh, you know, we're looking at our space and we're probably gonna come, come down in the number of square feet because we have people that enjoy working from home. And to your point, the productivity has been, if not, it's actually, I've had to tell them to take off time because they're actually so much. Um, so what's the future of work? I mean, are we going to see different downtowns? Are we going to see, are we going to see different landscapes now because of commercial space being used in a different way? I, I think the short answer is, yeah, I, I think there has to be an, and, and, um, work is changing and people aren't going to, we're not going to go back to that old normal, right? No one is, is thinking that they need to all of a sudden go back to working in a physical office for, for five days a week. Some will because it works for them. Um, but that's where the reimagine comes in, especially for those industries that are going to continue to be challenged. Um, for example, we have a um, lack of, of um, you know, housing, right? Can commercial real estate companies convert their, their office spaces to apartments or, or co-working spaces? We're gonna have to be reimaginative across the board here and organizations can step up to say, hey, we need to be, we need this and this is the only reason why we want this physical space. What can you do to work with us, with us to make it, make it so? So yeah, it, that to me is the, that's the, the five, 10 year challenge here, but um, it's gonna happen sooner rather than later. So I had a, a, a comment that, that I thought was pretty interesting as you were talking about what new physical spaces were look like. We've all moved to this um, open office space and the comment was cubicles are back. Um, kind of, we are sort of going back to the future here because of the, the spacing. Is, is that gonna be something that we're gonna be moving away from this open office space to more sort of confined spaces now? That could be one option. And if that works for you, the, the, the organization, and if that works for your space, then I would say, yeah, I could definitely see that happening. Um, but what I would also say is challenging, why do people need to be in those, those, those cubes? And um, it, 
the challenge that also that also brings is shared space and shared cubes. I see that there's a question in the, the chat about sanitizing um, equipment and sanitizing space. That is another big um, challenge here. And, and even in those, those spaces that have the correct physical distance, there's still shared surfaces and and, and, and ways of, of um, transmitting the virus through the air, right? And, and, and um, HVAC systems and, and filtration systems, those are all going to come up. So yes, there could be a shift towards the um, more cube-based or shift back to the more cube-based working styles, but that's not the only solution, right? It doesn't solve the problem in and of itself. There are other things to be considered along the way, like how does someone get out of their cubes? And if the only way for two people to get out of their cubes is to bump right into each other, then we need to think about how those cubes are going to be positioned. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a dynamic challenge. So thinking, so for instance, we're in, a, a, in an office building, a, 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 a tall office building. And I think there's, there is a lot we can do in our office, but I start thinking about shared spaces, the Singapore example, for instance, you know, how do you talk to employees about shared spaces that you really can't control? Or, you know, there's a cleaning crew that comes in that's hired by the, by the, the office that, that it's, it's more of a cursory type, generally speaking. How do you, how do you handle that part of, of things? And, and that is a challenging one too, because there is only so much that you can control. And, and it's, um, I'm, I'm looking at this. I don't know if anyone has seen this. Um, this was very famous or it was another thing, the what you can control versus what you cannot control. And um, I printed it out and put it up here because that is a perfect example of something where what you have control over is your ability to protect the health and the well-being of your employees by giving them as much um, security and, 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 and um, guidance and, and, and communication and establishing that early on. Um, working together with all of the, the tenants in a building, I think is a great way to make this a, a communal effort, knowing that there's gonna be disagreements, but we're all trying to do the same thing, which is keep our employees safe in a physical space because that's where we want them to be. And so um, the, the, the large commercial real estate and, and, and landlords are gonna be the ones to, to um, give guidance on that. But just to remember that you can only control so much. Yeah, no, no doubt. And there has to be at least that understanding. Let me pivot a little bit. You talked about um, the testing and tracing, which is, I think, really important. I've talked to a one large employer who's you know, really ca being cautious about bringing people back because their concern is you bring people back and then someone gets sick. Um, and then what do you do? Um, do you send everybody back home? Um, do you, then you have to disinfect. And, and so what are, you, what, what are you telling your clients on that front? Um, well, a couple things. So, so first, tests aren't available, right? I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is still, um, tests are not readily available to anyone who wants them. And so um, really what this is about is understanding um, suspected potential and confirmed cases and making sure that you have a effective way for your employees to share that information and then a response for what you're gonna do with that information. It, in, there are a lot of technologies that are coming out to actually like be able to in your space monitor who's that person has come in contact with. That's the that's the fully advanced, really mature version of, of um, contact tracing. At the end of the day, when we think about contact tracing, the, the public health organizations are going to, to facilitate a lot of that. But to your question around what does a company do, it's a question of what was it's very it's it's specific to the situation if this was someone who had a fever of 100 and 101 um was you know on they, they they were coughing while they were in that space and they were around a lot of people that to me is a situation where we would want to have a, a really effective response but if it was hey someone was um potentially came into contact with this person so all to say it's going to be very much case specific and understanding what you're going to do in those situations is the core to all of it, but not, not over, um, overdoing it and, and not making it kind of on or off, right? If you have one case, does that mean that you shut down the office? I don't know. If it was a serious case that could have potentially impacted a number of people across the office, they should probably all go into a 14-day quarantine. 
but does that mean that anyone who maybe wasn't in the office during that time can't go or right that's where some of that cohort based and 50 percent comes into play but you have to know who those people are and know how they're connected it tends to be a virus that th there's a lot of um, um, news articles and conversations about the r not number which is the the estimate of the infection rate that a person who is infected, how many people do they, do they infect, right? And right now, I think in the US, we're sitting in an R naught of about 0.7, meaning that we're, we're less, right? We're, that for every one infected person, only you know, 0.7 persons are, is getting infected. Um, if we're in a position where the R naught starts to raise in a community, meaning that there is heightened infection, if we see those case numbers go up, that's another another you know res response type type situation but in the kind of micro level within an organization um, it's going to be highly dependent because what we don't want to have happen is that people panic right this is not about fear this is not about doing that this is about being empathetic to each individual situation supporting them with their needs and then responding in a way that is that is grounded in the guidance from state and local public health authorities and also doesn't doesn't take away from the privacy and security that that we have to give to our people going through this. Thank you. We had an interesting question. I think that's uh, coming from the perspective of an employee. I'm just going to read it. Um, it's easier that way. It's a, is it appropriate as an employee to ask for this type of planning, the planning that you're talking about, from our leadership team before returning to work? I think it is, but do they also have this obligation? Ooh. That's a tricky one. I, I heard an interesting, um, I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent, but um, it, the, the best companies to work for will be the ones that are giving the, the most information and keeping their employees um, um, aware of and, and confident that the response is effective. And so speaking personally from Solemn, um, I had two town halls last week. Um, where, where we were given updates. There were multiple um, emails that have sent out and those have pretty much been the norm since March, um, you know, the week of March 16th or whenever that was, right? So um, we are constantly being given updates on our, our approach on what we're doing and how we're thinking about this. Um, obligation is difficult, right? Because there is um, only so much information that an employee should expect and there's a lot of uncertainty and, and people are trying to balance the, the um, guidance and, and, and recommendation at the same time, knowing that there is implications around um, you know, safety and security that they may not want to, to overstep. And so what I would say to that person is, is ask your manager, right? If, and, and start that conversation. If you're not hearing things, and maybe because people are not sure what to do, and they may be in that still that reactive space of trying to figure out the best answer, right? Trying to figure out what is the perfect way to, to, to return to work. And there's no perfect way. What you what we should be doing is planning, using the resources that are out there and making the case for this being an important aspect of the next, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months for years to come. So, and thank you for that. It, it, it's a tough question. Let me go ahead and ask you the inverse. You're, you're a company that, that we're doing all the right things, you know, to the extent possible, but then you have an employee that says, I don't want to come back. Um, how do you handle that? And I, and I don't like this answer, but I think it's the best answer I can give. It really depends because this is a situation where depending on that person's living situation, depending on that person's ability to continue doing what they're doing in a remote capacity, um, that may be okay. Um, I'll speak personally here. Um, I live with someone who has asthma and is immunocompromised. And so I'm healthy. I'm at low risk for, for the virus. I, I, I take all the necessary steps and precautions and limit that risk. But Am I going to feel 100% confident to go back to a physical space knowing that at the end of the day, I have to come back home to my wife? No. So what I'm going to do personally is, is work with my manager, work with my clients, and work with my teams to say, how do we make this work in the short term? This is my plan, and this is what I'm going to do moving forward. I will support you in that way, where there is then the in situations where it's like, okay, to do your job, you have to be in a physical space. That's a more that's a more challenging topic. So the, what I have said and the guidance that I've given to 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 slalom and to to a lot of our clients is that 
start with, can this work be continued remotely? So that should be your first, your first stop. If the answer is yes, awesome. Let's support that, that, that employee and give them as many resources as possible. Do it in a way where it, it, it meets the equity, where they feel like they're still a part of the team and engaged in the right way. And then from there, right, then it becomes a more challenging situation where it's like, okay, what are your, your, um, your FMLA benefits in place? Um, what, what do you want to do with, with, with PTO and paid time off? Um, what are some of those um, different employee benefit plans that you have available? So it's a challenging question, but the, the best guidance I can give is we've proven that remote work can be effective. So start there and, and understand why you want to force someone, why you would want to bring someone back and if they need to be in that space. It's such a good point. I mean, in December, I would have never said that this would be possible. Um, and it is. Uh, so it, I guess there is that silver lining. Um, I have a question here um, related, going back to, um, to property. Um, that basically, says the number of companies and nonprofits will want to reduce their square footage or of their office space, which means renegotiation of leases. How will, how do you think property owners will respond with a likely mass number of employees having the same interest? Yeah, and, and I don't know. I mean, I think we're gonna we're gonna see here really soon uh, some of the the articles and, and and folks that I've talked to. Right, it's it's about reimagining the business model and thinking about converting space to a different like converting it to to maybe um, um, apartments or 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 um, lofts or condos. Right, those are are some of the ways that I think um, uh, commercial real estate organizations are going to have to think a lot differently about their models. So um, I don't know, right? I, I think that there's going to be a position where we're all going to have to learn and adapt. Um, JLL, CBRE, those are some of the organizations that are starting to publish some of this information. So take a look at, at theirs. Um, I will say that JLL is one organization that has a pretty robust checklist and inclusive, included on that checklist are some of the things that, that you should be thinking through and asking of your property managers. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll shift one more time here. We're running out of time, but there's a question as to um, how are your clients or what are you telling your clients to do in terms of onboarding new employees during this time and how have practices changed? Yeah. Um, it, so what I will say is that in, in most cases, in, in some cases, there has been a hiring freeze. So onboarding of new employees is slower, right? There, there is less employees to onboard during this time, but that doesn't mean that it is not possible. So um, what I would say is like a welcome kit. So sending that information to someone's health, um, making them feel like they are, are, are receiving all the swag and the, 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 the you know, the stuff that they would get on their first day if they were to come in to have an, a, a desk. Um, being very intentional about it is really key. It, when you onboard someone, they get a lot of the, the, the onboarding experience through walking around the halls, bumping into someone in the, in the, you know, the kitchen and, and it's starting conversation in that way. And so what we've done is actually created like small cohorts of onboarding team who are in charge of different things, right? Like, like some person is responsible for, for reaching out and talking to this person about this thing and, and, and spending day one just pinging with this person, right? We, we connect like this, right? Like this is the most interaction that I've had with basically anyone um, other than my wife for the past eight weeks, right? And so um, giving them the ability to feel confident and comfortable with this type of interaction. It's easy with someone you know, it's easy with someone that, that you've done this before with, but with someone who's brand new, they're going to be in a position where they're gonna be so hesitant to ask for and want more time of people because they're trying to look like they're competent. But we need to give them the, 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 um, you know, the psychologist, psychological security to know that they're, they're, they are in this with us, right? Mm -hmm. We're in this together. Everyone knows that. And, and that they are in this with us and we want them to feel like they have the support of us and that we are here in any way that they need. It's part of that new normal you talked about. And, um, you know, we're, we're getting better and better at it. We, we actually brought someone on board um, um, on Monday and part of our normal huddle and, and kind of tried to get her going. But I, I think you're right. We're going to need to figure this out and um, as we move. Um, we're, we're, we're at the top of the hour, but uh, I'd like to finish on... Um, on a final final question, and, and that is, we'll we'll start with what keeps you up at night, um, but then but then what what wakes you up with with uh, with enthusiasm and hope the next morning? You know, I, 
I think what, what's keeping me up in, in, in this current situation is really just, and this is a bit heavy, but I will say it. So we're all experiencing a collective trauma here. Um, and, and, and that is the, the harsh reality that I think we all have to face. Um, we are the greatest minds in the world are trying to figure out how we protect our economy while also protecting the health of our you know, employees and people and, and, and the world as, as we know it, right? Um, the, the mental health challenges coming out of this are going to be just as substantial as the current situation we're in. And so um, what is keeping me up is being in a position where I am working with clients to help them bring back employees, knowing that there is no, um, there is not any guarantee that bringing them back will not result in a second wave, right? And everything we're talking about is to protect the well-being of, of individuals and their health in a time where we're all experiencing this collective trauma. So that is really the, the, the key to making sure that we're, we're being empathetic, we're, we're listening, we're learning, and we're not thinking that there is a way to like win this. It's about making sure that we're doing this in a way that is, is, is gonna respect the, the, the next, you know, five years of our company and, and, and doing it in a way. And, and what gets me excited is there are incredibly smart people out there that are, are incredibly passionate about this, that are eager to um, ignore the noise and, and, and focus on doing what's right and make this a, um, a plan, like make a plan and, and, and move the, the, the world in, in, a, in a better place. And, and you said silver lining here, there is a lot of silver lining in this and we're, we're experiencing, uh, you know, that next way of work in this new norm is gonna, is gonna escalate and, and, and challenge our thinking for years and years to come. That's exciting. And, and that's something where I, I'm a technologist at heart and I love change management. And this to me says like, yeah, let's keep it going. There, there's lots of problems that we can get out here. We can get to a place where we're, 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 we're um, leading and, and changing the world for the better. Well, I think, I think you should wake up positive then because you, you are, the work you're doing is changing the world for in, 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 a, in a much better way. So thank you for that. I, I think we'd all like to, um, to clone you and, and have you in our, in our businesses, but we will certainly take this time with you. So thank you for what you're doing um, uh, nationally and, and for your spending your time with us. We appreciate yeah. it. Um, there were a, a few questions about um, the, the, the presentation. We are recording this, so that'll be available for people and certainly get a hold of the chamber. And, um, and if you have follow-up questions, we'll, we'll try and get them over to, to Matt. Um, but with that, we want to thank everyone for joining us. We want to thank our sponsors once again for their strong support. And I'm, and I'm going to thank my team once again because they are truly amazing. We're so, so honored and pleased to have them. Matt, have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Bye-bye.